خوش اومدید هموطنان گرامی من شهر افشار هستم میزبان شما در پالیتیکس 365 امروز آه، یک مهمان آه، خیلی برجسته و فعال و واقعا یه تاریخ بی نظیری داره که به برنامه من دعوت کردیم آقای پروفسور ریچارد فاک ایشون بیش از 40 سال در پرینستون یونیورسیتی تدریس می کردن در زمینه های قوانین بین المللی روابط بین المللی قانون حقوق و الان هم در یونیورسیتی در سانتا باربرا تدریس میکنن و مخصوصا بعد از برنامه اکتبر 7 که در اسرائیل اتفاق افتاد تروریست اتاک حماس ایشون تو چند جلسه های مختلف شرکت کردن و منم اون جلسه ها را شاهد بودم و میخواستم حتما به برنامه من دعوت کنم که نظر ایشون رو در مورد واقعا آینده خواهر میانه بعد از اکتبر 7 و حمله حماس به اسرائیل و الان به اسطلاح فعالیت های اسرائیل در گاز استریپ چی هستش و علاوه اون ایشون یه ملاقاتی داشته با یه شخصیتی که حالا ایشون بهش مراجعه میکنه که خیلی جالب بود واسه من من واقعا تا حالا به فردی با فردی شخصا آشنا نشده بودم که با با این شخص ملاقات داشتم و حالا ایشون مراجعه بهشون میکنه uh, Professor Richard Falk welcome to Politics 365 such a joy and pleasure to have you here I'm so uh, happy with someone your background and your interest is is active in this community and in this helping bridge relationships and uh, studying international relations and speaking about international, international relations, such an important topic nowadays, especially with what's going on in the Gaza Strip and in the Middle East. Uh, so I really wanted to invite you to our uh, little podcast and have you tell us a little bit about your background and then really go into uh, what you feel um, a post-world after October 7th uh, will look like. Welcome to our program. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, I think the first thing to remember is that even before October 7th, the impact of the Ukraine war was reconfiguring international relations and was partially about the post-Cold War world order. And Russia, in a sense, was trying to reestablish its traditional spheres of influence. The U.S. was trying to, uh, and NATO, were trying to reinforce the geopolitical vacuum that emerged after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union. And China, in the background, had come to be an important player. So... One must look at the Gaza uh, explosion, if one wants to put it that way, uh, as connected with this other major breakdown of the post-Cold War world. And it will have implications beyond Israel and Palestine. Those implications are already beginning to be evident with Islamic forces allied with uh, Palestine and with uh, the global West, European colonial powers and the settler colonial white states of US, Canada, New Zealand and Australia basically aligned with Israel. So we're in a situation that is new and significant uh, for the future of international uh, political life. Thank you for mentioning uh, Ukraine. It's, it's really hard to imagine, uh, uh, again, as you said, a world uh, before and after uh, Putin, because Putin has made, as you put it, he wants to kind of reestablish the former Soviet Union. He, he already annexed Crimea. He wants to, if, if he can have his way, he'll keep the eastern uh, third of Ukraine. Um, but uh, all of those things are having rippling effects across the world, uh, as you put it. And uh, the Middle East is, is, uh, is also subject to those rippling effects, not to mention Iran's support of, uh, uh, of Russia by sending drones uh, to, to Russia. Uh, how do you feel with 
what's happened in, in the Gaza Strip and, you know, Iran's uh, influence in the region with all the Houthis and Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, you know, uh, I honestly don't know what Iran hoped to, or hopes to gain uh, from uh, the attack on Israel uh, and however much it was complicit. Uh, what do you feel um, uh, Iran's role or, or future is in the Middle East, given what's happening in the Gaza Strip right now? I think that's a very important and neglected question. Uh, but I would answer it in what you might find uh, an unorthodox way. I think the Iranian role is exaggerated. And I think it's exaggerated by Israeli and U.S. state propaganda to show that uh, these are not authentic oppositional movements. There's very little evidence that's been produced that there is any significant role beyond a certain kind of solidarity of uh, these uh, forces that feel that the West and particularly the U.S. and Israel have been uh, making their life uh, difficult. And you notice, even in the New York Times, that they never mention the Houthis, for instance, in Yemen without saying the Iran-backed Houthis. Or uh, they, they use the same language for Hezbollah. Uh, and I who studied these issues for a long time uh, find scant evidence of anything approaching what the U.S. is doing with a whole series of countries in the region. And the, you don't see that uh, Israel is mentioned as U.S.-backed Israel or the U.S. proxy in the region is Israel. So it's, it's, there's a propaganda filter that tries to make one see the uh, Israeli victimization as a consequence of aggressive Iranian behavior. My impression is that Iran, for all its uh, internal problems and wrongs of a different character, has been eager not to get involved too much in this conflict and has resisted uh, the temptation to really become a actor in behalf of the Palestinians. That's not that they don't want the Palestinians to succeed. They do, but, but there's little evidence that they are materially helping uh, the Palest Palestinians or Hamas to nearly the extent that the West and the U.S. is helping Israel. That's a wonderful uh, explanation. I think you're 100% you're right. I've rarely seen it clarified and crystallized, as you just put it. Uh, we don't introduce other groups in the world as the U.S.-backed or the Israeli-backed XYZ. But uh, because the sensationalism uh, of uh, the media is as, as it is, introducing the Houthis and the Hezbollah and Hamas as the Iran-backed, it just creates more uh, tension and uh, it, it feeds the fire that we like in this country, uh, right? We, we like those fires in the media, at least anyway. Uh, and the propaganda is all real. Uh, but I wouldn't call it sensationalism. I would call it propaganda because it, it wants to have a, have people think in a certain way about the conflict. Right, right. And a way that is manipulative of public opinion. And it's for that reason that I react to it. In a democratic society, you should have objective opinions of the sort you're trying to nurture on this podcast, not uh, not what the State Department and the Pentagon want Americans to think, but what is really happening as far as the evidence shows us. 
And right. there's lots that we can't know that we have to accept some uncertainty about. That, that's such a, uh, another insightful thought, uh, uncertainty. I remember in my grad school in public administration, uh, my professor said, I'm going to increase your tolerance for ambiguity. <laughs> and, you know, for- right? And I always remember that uh, because once you enter into the public world, public administration, public policy, most civilians, I'm going to say, <laughs> most ordinary people that are busy with their lives and they're, they got their own priorities and issues, they don't have the time to really analyze something objectively. And certainly media, create, as you say, creates that propaganda machine uh, and misleads people. So it's really hard to really just look at facts unemotionally. Uh, you 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 bring in your own filter from your own cultural background and look at all the anti-Semitism in the colleges, look at all the, whether it's against Muslims or, or Jews. Uh, these are all emotional reactions uh, to, because of certain uh, presentations in the media beyond the facts. The facts are this group, uh, you know, attacked Israel. Of course, it had uh, decades of uh, Israeli occupation and issues with each other. That's not a secret. Uh, but uh, uh, all of those people are reacting to events, which of course leads to, uh, and this is where I want to get your opinion, uh, all that propaganda not just leads into misinformed public, it eventually leads to public policy. It leads to action. Uh, how do you see that unfolding? Well, I'm very worried about that, that uh, implication that this kind of uh, thought control uh, eventuates in a policy that is uh, driven by uh, a militarist frame of mind. And I think that part of this dynamic goes back to the Vietnam War and the lessons that the American establishment learned from Vietnam And people that supported the war to the end were often described it as lost in the living rooms of America. And what they meant by that was that there wasn't enough control over the media. And subsequent to that, the Vietnam experience, there's been a much greater effort to make sure that the media feeds the American public a message that is uh, consistent with what the established uh, elites in the society would like to see people believe. And that's more or less what has happened, not only in relation to this conflict, but others as well, including Ukraine. Exactly. And I couldn't agree more. Going into an election year, you know, I always uh, say, you know, sometimes America is playing checkers and the world is playing chess because we deal with a four year election cycle. And often public policy is made during election cycles in reaction to the other parties uh, at the yin and yang between Democrats and Republicans. Um, You know, Biden, President Biden has been viewed by some as being weak uh, in international affairs, even though he's got an incredible legacy of of experience in foreign affairs. Um, Trump now, uh, former President Trump, uh, is positioning himself to combat that thinking and wants to be aggressive on all things. Um, How do you see uh, America's foreign policy uh, over the coming year, given we're in an election cycle, which creates all kinds of madness on many levels. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And uh, it's not only madness, but we have two leading candidates, neither of which, in my view, is suitable to lead a country with the kind of power that the United States possesses. Biden is fine as a domestic leader. But in foreign policy, he's uh, some kind of strange mixture of naive and aggressive. And, you know, he resisted, for instance, 
a political compromise early in the Ukraine war uh, because they wanted to teach uh, Russia a lesson. And in the uh, Gaza outbreak, uh, to sit, to stand and watch this spectacle that is viewed by most of the world as genocide, and not and not only to uh, be a, a spectator, but to endorse it and to provide extra military and economic assistance to Israel while it's going on has hurt the American reputation worldwide and has is very, very dangerous. And th there's an Iranian dimension to this, which is as Israel feels cornered by the fact that the, even though they've done all this devastating uh, violence, they're not for, they're not on the edge of victory. The Hamas is still a force, and it's more it is supposedly three times more popular with the Palestinian people than before October seven, and. It can't afford to lose because uh, Israel has paid this price. They've made this horrible public relations uh, policy that has hurt their legitimacy and reputation in the world as nothing pre previous has done. So the only option they have left is to expand the combat to include Iran and to draw the U.S. into that uh, that kind of encounter with the uh, idea that if the U.S. doesn't enter, it's going to lose control over both uh, the energy resources and the trading routes in the Suez Canal. So the high strategic stakes and it's a very dangerous situation because, again, one can't assume that China and Russia will let this happen. And and so you, it, the escalation dangers are very great. And Biden has shown irresponsible leadership. Unfortunately, getting back to the elections, the American public seems to care mostly about uh, the domestic scene, and there one has to be very scared of Trump, who for all his uh, braggadocia, while he was president, was not uh, as belligerent as Biden has been. Uh, he talks one way, but he actually opposed the what he called forever wars that are not being won, uh, so one is puzzled by what internationally a Trump president presidency would mean. And uh, in contrast, one is worried that it could mean domestically the advent of a certain variation on fascism. Thank you, uh, Dr. Richard Falk. I didn't go to Princeton. Uh, I didn't go to University of uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, but now I wish I had. Uh, <laughs> your your thoughts are so insightful, so uh, timely, so uh, thought-provoking that I'm going to impose on you again in the coming year uh, to have you join us and uh, help us uh, understand all that is going on. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.